Well, welcome to another special edition of Metro Conversations, Quarantine Edition. I'll do some introductions. Let's start with Patrick and we'll work our way around. Hi, I'm Patrick Johnstone. I'm a city councillor in beautiful, sunny New Westminster, British Columbia. And over to Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew Bond, a councillor in the District of North Vancouver. And of course, I'm Nathan Bahal, city councillor in Langley City. So it's been probably a couple months since we last chatted. How are we feeling? Uh, what's what's new in the district, uh, Matthew? Well, things are starting to open up, uh, obviously, just like uh, the rest of the province, uh, just over the past uh, week or so. Uh, playgrounds have opened. Uh, some of the major tourist kind of attractions, uh, the open spaces such as the Metro Vancouver Parks, BC Parks, and our own parks have started to open. So um, things are getting busier again, obviously. Um, and so I think people are kind of gradually easing into that. There's a lot of, um, you know, some tensions here and there between obviously local neighborhoods who are concerned with influx of traffic, but also uh, people that have not been able to access the outdoors in, in a long time. So uh, that's, a, that's a process we've been going through and kind of slowly been incrementally adapting to that. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting time to see uh, how this reopening is, uh, is proceeding. Cool, and we'll get to Patrick in a moment, but I, I wonder what it feels like, because you're in a place where a lot of people visit for recreation, so unlike Langley, where uh, it's all locals, basically, how does it feel? Like, are you noticing people feeling a bit uncomfortable on this sidewalk or in the trails? I, I think uh, when the COVID um, started back in March, um, there was a lot of concern right at the beginning and uh, a lot of support for and limiting activity even if in the in the district of north vancouver uh, the trailheads are kind of dispersed and far away um, so even limiting it from a lot of local residents uh, and i think um, it's uh, local residents were concerned about the volume of, mm -hmm. of coming and visiting their local neighborhoods um, it's it's difficult obviously because they are uh, not just local attractions but regional attractions mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think we're seeing, um, we saw a lot of concern around when all the parking lots shut down, people are, were still going to come. So there was a lot of uh, interaction that we had with how we changed parking restrictions in local neighborhoods so that lo the local residents aren't necessarily being overwhelmed uh, by visitors uh, and a lot of concern about that. But I think now that the major parking lots are back open, the uh, interaction with local residents is kind of reduced. There's still a lot of people out there on the trails. I, you know, anecdotally, uh, yeah. I've been the um, the lesser known trails and, and getting yeah. out in, in that way. But anecdotally, it's very, very busy in the woods. People, uh, especially with the recreation centers and everything, kind of yeah. the normal routines, sort of, you know, fitness and that kind of stuff. But down people are getting outside and and it's been very quite busy. Cool. So what about in uh, Patrick in New Westminster, the real center of Metro Vancouver, what's it been like? Yeah, we don't have wilderness as such, right? We don't have no. wilderness areas for people to go to. So we have seen a ton of people in our, on the streets, people on, in the parks, people in any public space. Any public space has got a lot of people in it these days because people are, yeah, they don't have recreation spaces to go through the traditional recreation spaces and people are, I think, spending more time at home. And when the weather is nice, people fill the spaces. So it's, it's good to see. We are like Matt suggested, we're, we're opening back up. Our playgrounds mm -hmm. are opening back up and our public spaces are opening back up. So we're starting to see recovery. Um, there is some, it's interesting, some concerns that we're hearing is, is a little bit um, on both sides. People are concerned mm -hmm. that we're not opening things up fast enough and other people are concerned that we're opening things up too fast. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to sort of balance that and to tell people, you know, do what you're comfortable with out in public and, you know, be, you know do what makes you feel safe but recognize that we have to be kind of kind and understanding about to other people using space and um, yeah. to say people shouldn't be out in the parks is really difficult if you, if people don't have a backyard to that, you know, the park is their backyard. Um, I'm a little worried about some of the changes that are not coming because we're, you know, us rushing back to regular old stuff again with traffic mm -hmm. and other negative things going on in our city. So I'm a little concerned about that, but um, the biggest concern for me right now is, is like probably as it was for a lot of time was, is budget is I'm afraid that we are getting back into opening things back up and we're back to providing mm -hmm. services, 
but the revenue stream is not going to come back with that. So we're having, yeah. to, so the, the save, the savings that we saw through the crisis um, have, have are, are being lost because we're having to start to provide more service, yeah. but the, but the revenue isn't coming back yet. So that's going to be an interesting thing to track through the recovery because we don't really know what this recovery is going to look like. Yeah, and I think we'll touch on that light, lightly, I think, a bit later. So your feeling, are, are you feeling uh, folks are comfortable? Are they anxious? Is it a combination of the both? Uh, yeah, all of the above. I think, yeah. I think everyone's going through their own journey right here. And it's not just um, people, the, not just public who are out in the spaces. It's, it's the business owners. It's people who work for the city. It's, it's everybody. It's, it's, it's an unusual time. No one's done this before. We're all doing mm -hmm. this for the first time. And I think it's, it's really difficult. Um, to, to sort through a lot of information that's out there and, and yeah. try to figure out, you know, um, just the, the argument about masks. Are masks good or are masks bad? And we tend to concentrate too much on advice we've been given and, or too much, too, um, we don't recognize it. Well, the science is evolving on this. And in some situations, the mask is good. In some situations, yeah. it isn't. There's no black and white here. It's, it's a bunch of gray and we're all learning. Well, I certainly noticed that when we first had the information come out in Langley, it was all about being consistent and consistent messaging. And people in a crisis, you need to provide that consistent message. But as we learn more and as we uh, open up again, that gets a little bit more gray. And I think um, we know that as um, elected folks. And I know the health officials know that, but sometimes that's really hard to get the message out to residents. Because we had this discussion in our community, like, you know, not all our sidewalks are two meters. As you know, most sidewalks are 1.5 to 1.8. Does that mean people should be walking on the street when they cross someone? Likely not. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry said that. Uh, we put a motion on to council to Fraser Health for clarity, but we're not getting that from them. Yeah. Uh, so do people risk going onto the street? Does it make sense for us to shut down a whole lane for like the couple of times people have to cross? We're not talking downtown Langley here, right? Right. We're talking about side streets. So it's really, really interesting as we open up. But I've noticed people here started off pretty uh, apprehensive of other folks walking. But I've seen more people in our parks, more people in our streets, more people riding their bikes than I've ever in the last 15 years I've lived here. And now people yeah. are actually friendly. They're saying hello again. <laughs> Everyone's not looking at you like you have the black death or whatever, right? So yeah. it's kind of good. But maybe this is a good segue. Um, Matthew, active transportation, uh, you like cycling. What's going on in, in your neck of the woods in the North Shore? Have you seen a reallocation of road space? Is this something that people want or desire? Um, there's, uh, I think, one thing that uh, our council uh, has tried to do, and our staff especially, is that um, we have a long, uh, deep history with a, for a lot of consultation on a lot of issues uh, mm -hmm. in the District of North Vancouver. And so change has always been met with, uh, you know, with apprehension in the district. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of consultative processes. And I think um, council is, is not interested in being seen as being opportunistic in a mm -hmm. situation uh, like we have right now with COVID. And so we have, we have not um, done what some other cities, either locally or around the world, have, have done with reallocating road significant amounts of road space uh, for active transport or, or, or for people walking or riding their bikes. Um, mm -hmm. We are doing some pilot projects uh, now with the phase two opening around supporting businesses, so allowing businesses to have more space in the roadway, specifically in, in Deep Cove and in Edgemont Village, which are you know, some of our, our local uh, village centers. Yeah, uh, to allow them to have that extra space so that they. But can... what about parking? It's, yes, and we are taking a, we are taking an inter incremental approach to uh, to removing the the parking in those areas and replacing it with uh, outdoor seating or basically just more air, air area for those yeah. to to recover. Because um, I think right now a lot of businesses, um, especially if it's a, a restaurant or any type of of food service industry. Uh, with the restrictions and the guidelines around physical distancing, uh, the amount of people that they can serve uh, in their in their existing spaces isn't doesn't necessarily make it viable for them to even open their business. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for now, we need to do something temporarily to support those businesses and to keep those businesses functioning. 
and, and uh, you know the community wants to do that and so we're making some some temporary trade-offs and doing it incrementally so that um, first of all that it works with the business that we can change it uh, if if needed and it's not uh, an opportunity uh, and it's not sprung on our community as an opportunistic um, yeah you know. and how are people receiving it now uh, since you've been doing this sort of incremental approach it, it's interesting uh, we haven't had a lot of formal feedback but you know the anecdotal feedback from the neighborhood facebook group or or the business yeah. is that um yeah this is nice and there's some people oh, that cool. say hey, you should just shut the whole street down which is kind of like one option you know so you're like might. piloting it you're doing the old idea of piling it at getting the, the community buy-in and then you can go from there which is exciting exactly i, I hope from there maybe i'm positive right? in being or, super or <laughs> so uh, speaking about that, I, we'll just go over to Patrick because I think he had a motion that he was championing uh, about reallocating, was it 10% of New Westminster's road space for active transportation or did I read that wrong? The city has, uh, before all, everything broke loose, uh, the yeah. city had some uh, strong uh, climate action um, um, work that we were doing. And yeah. we set seven bold goals for the city and one of the goals was to reallocate 10% of car space in the city, road space used primarily by cars for other purposes by the year 2030. 10% conversion. So that means it could become, um, parking lanes could become bike lanes, it could mean driving lanes, mm -hmm. could become bus priority lanes. It means that some road space could be just closed down and turned into public gathering space, all of the above. Um, so because of the situation right now, and as, as Nathan mentioned earlier, a lot of our sidewalks is in our older business areas are really narrow. We mm -hmm. accelerated that action a little bit, and we are, have already reallocated some road lanes, taken away some parking in some of our commercial districts in order to create more space for walking, just using temporary cone installations to take away a lane of parking and make it into extended parking lot. We're also doing an accelerated action to get um, patio space, much like Matthew was talking about doing in North yeah. District. Um, we have just fin just got that sort of process going this week. So we're starting to hear back from businesses right now and, and we're trying to get that done as quickly as possible. Thankfully, thankfully the province has given us this um, temporary licensing procedure until October to allow yeah. food and liquor primary to extend their licenses out into the street. So that's really going to help us manage a sort of a temporary process to get us through to the end of October. And then we can have a bigger discussion about what happens in a more permanent sense. So what have you heard from the, the folks in your community? Are they feeling uh, our, our excited BIAs, about this? Our BIAs are itching to get this done. And they, they, our BIAs are really excited about getting it happening and, getting, and making it work. Um, our BIAs are actually talking about some road closures this summer, some temporary road closures this summer in order to help their business areas. They're really interested in... It's interesting, I mean, our BAAs have gotten to that point yeah. now where they've gone past the, I'm worried about the parking on the street and they're now yeah. more worried about how we're gonna get customers into our stores. So that's been a really positive thing. It's been really good to work, really great work between yeah. them and staff to make that happen. And it's yeah, a we, summer without festivals. That's the thing, it's, New West has got a lot of festivals we've been excited about. And in a summer yeah. without festivals, we need to have a reason for people to come out to public space and hang out. Yeah, and I, I've noticed in our community, I think without all these things going on, people have rediscovered just the, the, I guess, going out, just going for a walk and rediscovering sitting in a park with some chairs. So I don't know if you've noticed in your community, but um, we have a park in our downtown and we got a lot of apartments and uh, people just grab their lawn chairs and plunk down on what I used to be like, why do we even have all this grass? It never gets used. Well, now it's being used. So. <laughs> right. That's, in the front of a three-story walk up they're using the front yard now finally exactly yeah. so it's like those 1950s planners planned for covid but that's about it so <laughs> uh, and yeah we've got this similar thing so with the patio space i know rba is pretty excited about reallocating some parking spots for that but more so they actually were thinking about shutting down fraser highway um like just the one-way stretch yeah. uh, which is about a couple of blocks yeah. a couple nights a week just so that restaurants could have the same kind of customers that they had in the past. And that's coming from business, that's not coming from council, yeah, which is I mean, kind of cool to see. <laughs> yeah, you look at the, I mean, there's a video circulating right now about the miracle on 34th, which is a street in Queens in New York where they've basically done a very soft road closure one yeah. day a week. And it is, it's incredible to see how just a couple of barriers, the street becomes a very different place. Yeah. 
It's well, it's good to, to see that this this is happening throughout Metro Vancouver, whether it's in the uh, more, um, I guess, uh, in the district there, they're more interested in seeing that evidence before they move forward, and they seem to be good with that. I always thought that New Westminster was a bit of a leader, to be honest, when it came to these bold moves. And uh, even out here in the Fraser Valley, we're seeing some of this happen, which is exciting. Um, but maybe um, I think something that's become very much important is Black Lives Matter. And maybe we can transition over to that because this came out. Um, obviously, this has been um, brewing for some time. And uh, it's just been really interesting to see what's happened and to see some of the rapid change that can happen in not only America and Canada and throughout the world in, in a few weeks. And I, I believe that it was timing um, and everything lined up. And now I hope we see some meaningful change. So a little bit of context about myself. Uh, and uh, we can talk about white passing because I think that's really important. So myself, um, my mom is black, my dad is white. She actually was born in New Zealand. Her family is from Liberia. She lived in Liberia, which is on the west coast of Africa. Uh, went to school in England and Montreal to finish nursing school before coming to New Westminster, before going to the Okanagan and meeting my dad, where I'm from. So growing up in small town BC, uh, where there was like two other black people, it felt like in our town of Vernon, uh, definitely you, you notice the subtleties of racism in British Columbia. And I especially noticed that when my uncle came over and immigrated uh, from Liberia to Vernon. He was a civil engineer, um, so he had all the qualification. He actually went to a school in the Netherlands. People were very, very interested in talking to him on the phone. But when they met him in person, all of a sudden those jobs in the interior just evaporated. Mm. He actually ended up uh, moving back to Liberia uh, because he couldn't get any work here, uh, except for like, you know, working at the convenience store or as a security guard. So I definitely saw that. And I know that people weren't very interested in, or, you know, no one would say it, but you know, when you see interracial couples in a small town, you definitely get side eyes from people. And because people knew where I was from, um, and they knew my mom. Uh, I certainly had in, in school people say derogatory comments that you would expect to hear, which is really quite shocking and uh, stuff that I really haven't thought about a lot because living in Langley, uh, it's not like people are like, well, you're not totally white. I don't know where you're from, but I've never experienced uh, what I could, you know, being pulled over with a gun pointed at me. That's nothing that I've experienced, uh, luckily. So I, I can't even imagine what that would feel like. But I know that it's here in BC and I've seen it in my family. So I don't know, what do you think about uh, people who are, who are white passing or white, what role uh, do we have? I don't know, Matthew, why don't you start? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, a poignant conversation right now. You know, I'm also well, white passing. Uh, I am uh, indigenous. Uh, my uh, family's from uh, Pickwapanagan in uh, Golden Lake, Ontario. Uh, I'm an Algonquin, uh, a uh, member of the Algonquin First Nation, um, but uh, it has been uh, a long time since, uh, since like you, I've uh, you know experienced that type of those type of comments or that type of uh, prejudice or racist, uh, racial um, comments uh, firsthand. You know, probably since elementary school or or, or high school, and uh, you know, I think. Um, uh, Again, you know, people will ask, uh, "Are you, you know, you're not 100% white, but you know, the the, um, uh, the, the family story um, was, uh, you know, we're 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 Italian, right? <laughs> Italian yeah. or, or something like that." And um, you know, that's yeah. probably a whole other conversation about uh, about how um, that story evolved in Canada. Um, but I think you know, right now, um, with all of the the protest and all the attention that's being drawn on this issue, I think uh, it's a good, it's a very good time for those of us that do have the privilege of being shielded by our whiteness mm -hmm. uh, to reflect and to reflect on, uh, you know, what our experiences have been, to listen to the experiences of others that have not had that privilege and to really learn and find out where we can use that privilege and that power that we have, such as us as elected officials, yeah. to support uh, the changes that are necessary to 
would bring that uh, equity and that equality for for people uh, no matter what color they might be yeah i think that's really fair and uh, patrick i guess i'll throw it over to you so what do you think your role is in all of this yeah that's a good question um <laughs> I mean, but the, the first response is, you know, shut the hell up and, and, and listen for a while. But, um, yeah. but even that can be a bit of a dodge, right? Because I do have a responsibility as an elected official. I'm part of, of sort of running the system that is, that is being challenged right now and is being questioned mm -hmm. right now. Um, I guess your first responsibility is to open your eyes and, and, and listen and, and sort of transition from being shocked to what you see to, to realizing that you you really shouldn't be shocked by what you're seeing and that if you're shocked by it there are people who aren't shocked by it it's their everyday experience so yeah. it's hard when you don't you know it's hard to think about it for, you know, without personalizing it without bringing it to ourselves but um but it's not about us but i wonder i don't know what to i don't know what to think i don't and i want to hear what you guys think about um, yeah about the conversation around i mean the the phrase we're hearing a lot of right now which is defund the police right yep. okay it's a, it's a, it's a, and i mean i have we in us Spencer have a police force we have a yep. municipal police force i can't remember which of you two have so we have a police board in the city we don't have rcmp operating in our city as as our community policing mm -hmm. so um and i wonder about what our role at a council is when it comes to addressing this so what are your police experiences in your cities well, I guess I'll go over in um, in Langley because we we have a very complicated agreement between us, the township of Langley. We're contract RCMP, so there's an agreement with the BC government and the feds. So it's a basically we have very little say except for the soft power that comes from council. I don't know, Matthew. What do you got we're, over we're here? In the same, same situation because we have uh, it's the North Vancouver RCMP. So again, again uh, North Vancouver City and the district. Uh, again, contracted with the with the RCMP. Okay, so I guess it's over to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you have it. You have it special, but there's things we can do, right? So this is something right. I've been thinking long and hard about, and you've been talking about, you know, if you have that privilege and you've also experienced what it's like, um, what can you do? So I was like, okay, well, I don't think. Uh, while we'd love to sort of look at how policing works, that's a very big discussion that needs to happen. But what can we do right away? So one of the things that was really interesting I was thinking about is there was this discussion about equity and regional growth planning, right? Uh, and that was coming up from Metro Vancouver and I sort of paid attention to it, but not really thinking, oh yeah, this is good to have, but not really relating it to my personal experience until now. So it's like, hmm. So if we want equity in regional planning, we know that people who are black, who are indigenous, are generally poorer, are in places that are under or over policed, uh, don't have same access to opportunities. And there's a lot of things that we as a municipality do beyond policing that can contribute to whether someone can succeed or not. So I think that one of the things I would like to see in my community is how do we embed that framework of equity into even something as fundamental as our official community plan and, and go from there. And we're in the middle of that process now. So I'm excited and I'm hoping that people on my council will basically let us look at things through an equity lens. So that's kind of what's been on my mind. Yeah, Councillor Nakagawa here in New West has put forward a motion last meeting or the meeting previous, um, basically uh, addressing that actually, addressing how we're doing our public consultation and in mm -hmm. the context of, a, of how we're gonna recover from COVID. Okay, mm -hmm. We're gonna be getting this phase of recovery from COVID how are we communicating with the community to make sure that that recovery is going to be done in a yeah. way that is that is equitable to recognizing that people uh people of color indigenous people in our community uh recent immigrants to our community have been affected much worse by by the by the by the um disruption of covid than than yeah. most other people in the community and how are we going to do that consultation to make sure that we're actually trying to fit a equity lens around it and that's yeah. going to speak to our future consultations around community planning but it's a big it's a challenge how do we it is connect, a challenge how do we, we connect to people who've never been successful at connecting with or maybe even haven't tried but doesn't that mean that we should actually be trying to encourage people that are from those communities to be part of the system right because it's just like and I'll let uh, Matthew talk in a bit, but it's the reason, same reason we have people with disabilities on our advisory design panels. I don't know what that's like. So it's really, it's good that we at least acknowledge we need to have equity in our policies, but even better, we need people with those lived experience to tell us what we need to do. 
So Matthew, what do you see at your public consultations? What kind of demographics show up? Well, it's, it's you know, uh, just the one point that you, the one thing that you said there where, you know, um, trying to fit um, people that don't usually show up uh, or, or are not represented into our system, into the system. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, I, I think there's a very interesting discussion going on around, around that right now is that, that it's not that people aren't being represented in the system. It's the system that is, um, the, the system is discriminatory itself. And so, mm -hmm. you know, um, what changes need to happen to the, to that or, or reforms or like defund the police, you know, have a completely different system that's built up from the ground based on, yep. uh, on equity. Um, so that's a, a whole nother discussion for people that are uh, much more knowledgeable <laughs> about that than, yeah. than, than us, I think. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's a difficult conversation. Again, uh, you know, we haven't m had many meetings uh, at, at council or opportunities for public discussion since COVID began. But, you know, uh, anecdotally from the neighborhood discussion groups, it, it's, it's a challenge in, in North Van. You know, our, our community is, um, you know, represented, like our representation uh, on council is, you know, all visibly white, uh, all of our... Mm -hmm senior uh, executive level staff, uh, you know, um, you might think that kind of matches the demographic of our community, but, you know, we are a relatively um, Caucasian affluent community. And so tackling, opening a conversation about race um, is, it runs into all the typical things about white privilege or white fragility or all, all mm -hmm. this. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it can sometimes be difficult for for leaders or elected leaders um, who who don't see that issue or that issue does not come up for discussion uh, to yep. bring that up as an issue and to um, to champion that cause when either it's, it's never it's never you know at least in my six years on council it's never been a point of discussion. Yeah, uh, I think I think. I think a trap we fall into with this is again a little bit to what Nathan was saying is that we our first reaction being people who are involved in this and already have these privileges is to try to invite people who don't have those privileges into our process and we have to recognize that our process is the reason why they're not engaging in our process is because our process doesn't work it doesn't work nope. to engage and we can't expect uh, marginalized people to come into a city council meeting or a public hearing or even or a, a workshop they're not going to workshop, show up to workshop in a, in when you're busy trying to feed your kid and you've yeah, just gotten yeah, yeah. off your second shift let's, right? let's talk about robert's rules of order and how they yeah. and how that differs how you gain con consensus through robert's rules than you would through other through other cultural approaches right mm -hmm. so we have there are a lot of systemic things that we're discussing in our consult in our uh, this public engagement equity uh, process to try to figure out how do we actually how do we even recognize what we're doing wrong and that's the first step we're at unfortunately we're still at that first step yeah um, but at least we have I feel like we're at this point where people are willing to have the conversation now like I was walking down the street here in Langley and someone wrote on the sidewalk black lives matter I don't know if I would have seen that in like like people I believe in Langley want to do the right thing don't get me wrong but I don't think I would have seen that on a sidewalk uh, a year ago uh, yeah. So that means I think at least people are, are willing. And I guess <clears throat> I wanted to go back to this too, because you need to see yourself in your own history, right? Um, at least for me. So I remember when you looked at the textbooks, you know, I was like, okay, so white people from Europe came over. This is what we were taught. They didn't like each other. So they fought each other. And then there was a couple of rebellions. And then um, there was this Métis guy and they didn't like him in Eastern Canada and then everything was good and there was a railway at the end. <laughs> that was a history of Canada that they uh, taught us in school. Yeah, then we fought right? some wars in Europe. Yeah, and then I didn't, like, I didn't really learn about residential schools and the devastating effect and how it just destroyed a generation until I was actually, when I worked at a TV station, and there was a series called First Talk, uh, which was about Indigenous people, uh, or by and for indigenous people for APTN and just listening to those stories just like opened it up for me and even something as simple as like uh, so Douglas um, and I don't know his complete history and it's colonial so it's problematic but like so I'm mixed race and I don't think about what other people were mixed race in the history of BC 
And I just assumed he was white, like you would assume, because we're taught that white is power and white is government and white is what defined Canada. So I'm like, oh, so this guy was born of mixed race. He was the first governor of our province. He kind of looked like me. I'm like, oh, this really gives, so like I could actually be part of this narrative. I'm actually part of this country. And I think that's really powerful, at least for me. I don't know if that's powerful for other people when they can see themselves represented through the history of this nation. So it's problematic as it is. So that's, that's, I, that's, been, that's been something that's been really important to me. Yeah. And yeah, I think seeing that connection and I was really encouraged that the provincial government is like, well, you know what, maybe we should acknowledge this. I mean, we didn't even get indigenous history in the Okanagan. And we had a program that was developed by Okanagan Indian Band that was in our school and it was optional. So they don't even teach us about local history. Right. It's just like, how are you, how do you, how do you fix the next generation if they don't even know what's wrong? I don't like, <laughs> is there something we can do as local governments? Cause we're not the education system. How do we as local governments uh, tell those stories? Oh, absolutely. We have control over, we have control over so much in our local government about what stories are told from this, from uh, the, the people whose names are on our streets to, uh, to the, um, the stories that are told in our, in our libraries, stories that are told in our community centers, in our arts galleries, in our, we've all got museums. Mm -hmm. and, and those stories that are told in those museums are still incredibly colonial stories. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so there, there's a lot we can do and there's and there's a lot we can do with our public spaces we still have our public spaces that are still based on the colonial idea of what a public space is for what it's referred mm -hmm. to how it's used um we need to we we have uh, i think there was actually a presentation tonight at uh at uh, vancouver parks board don't ask me why i was watching their parks board meeting tonight <laughs> so there's a discussion tonight about decolonializing their park space and about recognizing mm -hmm. that public spaces are used differently by different cultures. And we still think mm -hmm. about the way we use our public spaces in a very colonial, very British mindset. We don't think about food gathering in our public spaces. Yeah. Like, like, like as, for, as one small example. So um, there's a lot we can do, but at first we, we need to be educated and we need to be willing to educate ourselves as elected officials and, and our staff. As staff of cities yeah. have to be educated and understand what the context of the land we're on. Yeah, so Matthew, in the context of Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter, because I think that Indigenous people are even more disadvantaged than Black populations who are disadvantaged in Canada. Has, what has it been bringing up in, in, your, in your mind? What have you been feeling about this? Is there something that like, you would like to see in the next little while happen? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, recognizing that we're having this conversation as um three vis visibly white guys is yes. kind of um, yeah, you know yeah. uh, i'm hesitant to have you know yeah to think of 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 for me to do anything get out there yeah. do something or fix something because i think that um both the indigenous communities and the black communities have been doing this work for a long mm -hmm. time and uh what might be a way forward for local municipalities is to lift that work up um, and uh, you know we don't necessarily need you know we don't need a colonial system to go in um, and and try and figure out how to fit that I into the existing system we need to uh, lift up the work that so many people have been doing for so yeah. long and, and to bring that uh, to the forefront so um, you know there's a lot of you know in North Vancouver, we have both the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation that are our mm -hmm. neighbor. Um, and so there's a lot of work that we can do, uh, f that we have to do first to kind of figure out how we engage with them on, on you know, nation to nation type uh, discussions. Yeah. And, you know, again, that's, that's challenging. I think there's still, um, there can be a, paternalistic attitude um, for municipalities uh, mm -hmm. typically with their um, First Nation neighbors and um, how do we how do we change that attitude and how do we um, you know look at our our neighbors um, as as uh, independent nations right um, yeah you know, 
an easy start would, you know, even in the District of North Vancouver, um, having a conversation about um, about the recommendations out of out of, of out of the two reports that have come forward in the past five years on uh, missing and uh, murdered Indigenous women and girls, and on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Right? Um, yeah. Have we acted on those on those recommendations. Right? Have we had that conversation with our First Nation neighbors about what do these recommendations mean for us in our community? Uh, and I can say we haven't. Um, so, you know, moving forward, uh, that would be something that I think is necessary as at, at the minimum, uh, at the minimum for a first step. Yeah, no, that's so important. And I think you, when you see these people, they've already, a lot of the people who've been doing the work already have the recommendations. It's just up for us to actually put that in action. Because you're right, that those two reports, um, they came out a long time ago. And I think uh, there was a, a something that came out just recently saying they're still waiting, yeah. right? So yeah. we don't even, we just have to do what people that are from marginalized communities have asked us to do instead of, you know, just play, being, I, I feel like sometimes you're right. It's like the they're there trying to be paternalistic or we'll go to a ceremony, but that's about it. And there's more we can do. What do you think, Patrick? I, I, I'm just thinking, I mean, I think that New Westminster is, we've began, we began a reconciliation process. Um, I, I, I think with, with, with uh, uh, good goals, with a good heart, with, with, we, we sort of begun this process, but, and we were doing some good work, but it's one of those things that kind of got put down the priority list because of the crisis, because of COVID, for example. I think that we, you know, it's one of those things that a city in a good time starts to do work on and then other priorities come along. And some, I think that there's been a lot of small steps done by cities that have ended up being relatively meaningless steps because they've been independent things that happened during a good time or when, thing, when it was the right time to do something. And then the momentum goes away and, and, we, and then we start again in a couple of years. And that, that's, yeah. the unfortunate pro, that's the unfortunate pattern, isn't it? And I don't know how to break out of that pattern other than... <laughs> It's a pattern that breaks trust too, right? You don't absolutely, have absolutely. Yeah, and in Langley, I don't even think we're at the place of even starting the journey of reconciliation. If I'm being honest, so uh, yeah. so we have we have a very long ways to go, but uh, I guess we can get final thoughts because this time has come to an end rather quickly. Um, so um, I won't give Patrick the final words, so you can have the third final word. <laughs> who me? Yes. Is there I, I anything else? I don't know if I have any final words right now. Um, I just be, um, it's, it's a terrible time right now for a lot of reasons, but it's a time for, because of the crisis, the COVID crisis, because of what's going on right now with, with um, Black Lives Matter and with our awakening perhaps of, of inequity in our communities. Um, there's a, it's, it's hard right now, but it's, it, it, it's good that it's hard. It's good that we're thinking about this and it's causing people like people who are comfortable. It's causing us stress and we're unsure about it. That that's a challenge for us to, uh, yeah, open our eyes, open our ears and listen and try to understand and think about what the hell we're going to do to make this better. I, I don't, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging time right now, but it's a good for time sure. to be doing good work. So we should be getting work done right now. Don't use the hard time as an excuse not to do this work. Well, I think this, the hard time has really highlighted inequity, right? Because yeah. the hard times really draw that out. And now we see it plain as day. And now we have to act. And we have to, as they say, listen to what people are saying, learn. And then I think importantly, let these people um, have the, the floor. And what they're saying, do something, work with them to do that, or just get out of the way and let them do their thing. Uh, <laughs> that's that's our, our role, I guess. Um, so what about you, Matthew? I'll give you the last word. I have to follow that one up. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, I think I'd echo a lot of your comments, Nathan, I think, um, especially for those that have benefited from these uh, oppressive or racist systems or colonial mm -hmm. systems, all, all in one and the same. Um, how do you, you know, adding on what you uh, to what you said, what um, elements of power can you give up and give back to the people that have um, not had that power um, because of the system, because of the way it's been designed? Um, I 
I don't know what that is right now. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. what does that, what does that mean, right? Um, you know, I think about representation in our communities. Uh, I think about um, yeah, that's. I think that's the main thing I'm thinking about is representation and and making sure that uh, those issues are heard and they're acted upon, and uh, and that the those who face those inequalities are 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 really being represented um and whether that's in the current system or some new type of new system that you know uh backs away from the history um that we've had with it um i i don't know right now so i'm just kind of listening yeah. and learning and doing a lot of reading and yeah. and um trying to uh, see what those that have done this work before have have recommended or or put forward already 